We want to take our Bibles right now, if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This passage deals with difficult decisions. Difficult decisions. We face them all the time. Uh, maybe decisions about how to spend your finances, uh, decisions about how to handle a hardship, how to plan for the future. There are lots of difficult decisions that we face pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, the Apostle Paul shares with us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 his way to help focus and bring clarity to t- difficult decisions in his life. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we have as our ambition, whether at home here on earth or absent, to be pleasing to him. To be pleasing to him. What is your great goal every day? What is your great goal every day? Paul says his great goal and everyone's great goal should be simply to please Jesus. That it really sums up all that we really need to do. We don't need to pe- please the other people in our lives. You don't need to, p- to please your boss. You don't need to please your neighbor. You don't need to please your wife. Actually, you don't even need to please yourself. Jesus is the only one that we're going to stand before at the end of this life and give account to for the, everything that we did and said and thought is the Lord Jesus Christ and pleasing him is all that's going to matter in that day. Pleasing Jesus. If you face a difficult decision, don't know what to do, ask yourself, what would please Jesus here? And then do it. That will really help bring clarity and focus on how to make difficult decisions. Just find out what pleases Jesus. Now today we are opening up again to the letter of Paul to the Corinthian Christians. Uh, Last week in chapter 7, we looked at the topic of, well, first of all, they had asked him a whole long list of questions. And he starts with answering their first question in verses 1 through 9, and that was, is it okay to stay single or do we need to get married as, as single people? And you remember Paul's answer was, is it okay? It's good to remain single and not get married. There's so many more advantages if, you, if God has given you that ability to do it, stay single. Well, this week in the verses that we have before us, Paul goes on to answer their second question of the list of questions, and it has to do with making difficult decisions in a difficult marriage, in a difficult marriage. And specifically the question is, is it okay to deal with marriage problems, marriage difficulties, by taking the option of divorce? By taking the option of divorce. Now, you may think that divorce is a modern problem that we have and they didn't have it in the ancient past. That's not true at all. Uh, Divorce has long been uh, a problem uh, going on in Rome. It was a problem during the times that uh, the Corinthians were living. I read this this week. It says, to divorce, one or both parties in a Roman marriage simply had to consider themselves no longer married. It was advisable to notify the other partner But no, legally, it was not required. No public authority was involved. Romans didn't get divorced. They simply left. That's how it was handled in the days of of these people who are writing this letter. And their question is, is this okay? We have marriage problems here in our church in Corinth. Is it okay to deal with it by just leaving and, and, and walking away from the marriage? And that is what this sermon today is all about. God's options for a difficult marriage. Now you might say to yourself, what, Pastor, I'm not sure why we need to hear a whole sermon on this. Well, number one, we're working our way through Corinthians, so really God has brought this to our our attention. But there's two practical reasons to do this. Number one, many, many here are married. And all marriages go through difficult times. All marriages go through difficult times. And we need to know what are God's options to deal with difficulties the right way and the wrong way. And this will help very much in this. Uh, Number two, you may not be having marriage difficulties at this moment, but you will likely have to give counsel to someone before you die. Someone who will come to you and say, hey, what about marriage? How, uh, what was your position on divorce? What, What do you understand? And your job will not be to give what you think, As God's priest here in this world, as one of the saints of God, your job will be to give what God says about handling marriage problems, particularly the aspect of divorce. Remember, each week you go out into the world as God's ambassadors 
to be able to serve the people in this world, and you need to know his opinion about how to handle marriage difficulties properly, and specifically about his uh, the issue of divorce. So we all need to listen to this, uh, because either our marriages need to know the right way, or we need to be able to counsel people in order to go the right way. So this morning, God's options for difficult marriages we're going to begin by seeing that Paul splits it into two halves. The first half is for Christian couples, and then he's going to give, give the answer. And then the second half is for uh, Christians married to non-Christians, and there's a set of answers for those. But he begins for Christian couples. What is God's option for Christian couples who are having marriage difficulties? Look uh, with me at verse 10, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, and it says this. But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, let her remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not send his wife away. So what can a Christian husband and wife do when they have marriage difficulties? Before Paul answers this question, notice what he says there in verse 10. He says right up front, not I but the Lord gives this answer. What Paul is saying is that Jesus has already answered this. And he then quotes what Jesus gave uh, as far as what he taught. He takes them actually back to the book of Matthew where Jesus addressed this problem. In Matthew 5, 31 and 32, Jesus said, You have heard that the law of Moses says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a letter of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife unless she has been sexually unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And everyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The Corinthians asked, is it okay to deal with our marriage problems by taking divorce as an option? And Paul addresses them back to what Jesus had already taught on the subject, and the answer is no. No, that is not an option for a Christian couple to take unless... Adultery has taken place. It is not an option for a Christian couple. Now, you're not going to hear this counsel as you go out into the world and <clears throat> seek help <clears throat> excuse me, from a professional counselor. You're not going to hear this from many professional counselors. You're not going to hear it from many professional Christian counselors either. And you're not going to hear from many pastors who are giving marriage counsel. This is not something that is looked on today as uh, wise. Many people will say, well, look, uh, God wants you to be happy. God does not want you stuck in an unhappy marriage where you're unfulfilled and you don't have the partner that you'd like. If you find somebody else that is more appealing, you, you, you shouldn't have to be stuck in the marriage that you have. You shouldn't have to be put up with feeling uh, disillusioned and discouraged. You sh shouldn't have to put up with any type of mistreatment at all. If you want to leave your marriage, life is too short to be stuck in a bad one. Go and just end your marriage and move on. That is the marriage counseling that you will hear from most sources in our society today. But listen, none of that is from God. None of that is from God. Even if it comes from a pastor, those words are not God's words. God has made very clear repeatedly in, in the Bible what, what, what his position is. It says in Matthew 19, 9, Whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. And he says it again in Mark chapter 10. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman, commits adultery against her. And then he says it again in Luke 16. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. There is absolutely no wondering what God's position is on divorce being an option for two Christians that are having marriage problems. He says no, unless adultery has happened. Absolutely no divorce as, a, as an option for you to consider. These are not easy words to hear because divorce is so common. You'd say, well, why do I have to be stuck in an unhappy marriage? Why can't I divorce about this? Well, the passage that, that we have here uh, that Paul is quoting in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' words, gives us the reason why divorce should not and must not be an option for a Christian couple. 
read it, read it again. It says, a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been sexually unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a woman, a divorced woman, commits adultery. Paul is saying here, the reason why married couples cannot just divorce and start over is because of what happens when they remarry if they do divorce. It is the sin of adultery. Now, what is adultery? Adultery is the sin of being sexually unfaithful to your spouse. But you say, well, how does that happen? If you ended one marriage and started another marriage, how does having this second marriage now mean you're committing uh, sexual unfaithfulness to your spouse? And the answer is clear. God says that this marriage didn't end. That's what he is saying here. Unless the marriage, divorce rather, unless the divorce was on the grounds of adultery, this marriage did not end. So when this person now remarries, they're not remarrying and starting over. They're committing adultery with, with a second person. God's view of marriage, the truth that God says, the true view of marriage is marriage is permanent. Divorce does not end a marriage. And so when a person who gets a divorce, yes, in the eyes of the state, this has been legally, have a contract, have uh, lawyers present, it's declared the marriage is over, but in the eyes of God, it didn't happen. Divorce does not end a marriage, unless God says, uh, as it says, that adultery has taken place. And that is why God has said, Christian couples cannot consider divorce as an option to dealing with their marriage problems because divorce doesn't end their marriage. It doesn't solve anything. Now, what if a Christian has heard these words and they're already divorced? What do you do about that? that Paul addressed that in, in verse 11. Look at verse 11 again. He says, but if she, the, 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 the woman, does leave, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. This is what God says are the options to be taken if a person has already divorced and now hears these instructions from God. The two options are you have to remain unmarried, remain a single person now, or go back to your spouse. And why? Why can't you remarry? Because again, because of God's view of the permanency of marriage. That the divorce that was gotten was gotten in the eyes of the state, but it was not gotten in the eyes of God. You are still married to that first marriage partner. So the only options available to, are, to you are to don't remarry or to go back to that marriage partner, who in the eyes of God just, you are still married, married to. What about this situation? What if a divorce was based on adultery? There were, can a person remarry now? God doesn't specifically address that issue, but many churches, including our church, take this position. When God permits a, a, a divorce, God also permits remarriage. Where God permits a divorce, in the case of adultery here, then God would permit remarriage. So the position of our church is that if a spouse, if two spouses are having marriage difficulties, adultery has taken place, then they can divorce, and that also means that they can remarry. What if a Christian divorces their spouse without adultery taking place and then remarries and now is in a second marriage? What does God say to do about that? There are no specific instructions to say about that, but our church and many other churches take this position that when you realize what God says, that the first marriage did not end because there was no adultery going on, that what is going on now, he calls adultery. So number one, you confess that sin to God. You tell God you're sorry and that you, you would, would, would turn from it if you could do it over. And then number two, you stay with your present marriage and move forward, giving God the best that you can in that new situation. That is what our church holds and what many other churches hold. Now, these words from God are very hard to hear. They go completely against what most counseling is going to say these days. But remember, God loves people. God's not just making rules and trying to make people's miserable, lives miserable. He loves people and he wants them to make the best choices for their difficult marriages. And he has many right options to take, and we're going to look at some of those later. 
many good options to take to help resolve difficult marriages, but he says one option to not take for two Christians. And we'll put this on the screen again. The option for two Christians when they're having marriage difficulties is no divorce unless adultery is involved. And even then it's not required, but it is permitted if adultery is involved. And we say that because it is our policy as a church to never encourage someone to d divorce who it does happen to have grounds because of adultery. Our position as a church is to do what Hosea does in the book of Hosea. Hosea has a wife who commits adultery, and he does not divorce her. He brings her back, reconciles, renews the marriage, forgives her, and moves forward. And that is what we always try to encourage people to do. Even though they might have grounds for divorce, we encourage them to not take that as their first option. Our job as the church leaders would be to go to help the one who had committed adultery and bring them back to Christ so that they're now walking with Christ and then to do everything we can to see the marriage saved and to bring them back together so that they can move forward through experiencing God's forgiveness and forgiveness between each other. And yet we realize that that's not always possible. And so we have had marriages in our church that because of adultery did end in divorce. And God recognizes that here. And he says, in that case, then you are allowed to remarry. Now, what if a Christian couple, or rather, what if it's not a Christian couple? What if it's a Christian who is married to a non-Christian? And God says there are differences in the answers for this. Uh, in Corinth, the person could have gotten saved, heard Paul preach, received Christ, and they go home and tell their family about it and their spouse doesn't want anything to do with it. The spouse may be active in a, a temple to a pagan god, offering sacrifices there several times a week. And the question is, what do we do about this? Wouldn't it be better to find a Christian spouse and make a Christian home? What, what options do we have here? And they're asking Paul this question. Paul addresses that in verses 12 to 14. Look at that. <clears throat> He says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her husband, her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. All right, Paul starts off verse 12 by saying, I say this, not the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean Paul's saying, hey, you know, this is just my opinion. You can take it or leave it. Uh, this, this isn't God's words. No, that's not what he means at all. What he means is Jesus, when he was here on earth, did not teach on this subject. So I don't have, like I did in the first case, the ability to go back and just draw up what Jesus said. Jesus did not address that, but now I'm going to address it as a, uh, an apostle appointed by God to be his mouthpiece. And so, yes, this is from the mouth of God, even though it didn't come out of the mouth of Jesus, it came out of the mouth of Paul. And this is what you do regarding whether a Christian married to a non-Christian having marital problems can choose divorce. God himself says... If the non-Christian wants to stay in the marriage, no, you don't get divorced. If the non-Christian wants to stay and you're having difficulties, but they want to stay, then you, then you let them stay. Verse 12 says, he, the brother in Christ, must not divorce her, the unbeliever. Verse 13, she, the believer, must not send her unbelieving husband away. God's clear about that. A Christian might be concerned that because of an unbeliever in the home, that that home will miss God's blessing. That home will not be you know, uh, showered on and smiled upon by God because there's an unbeliever uh, as part of the marriage. And Paul is saying it's the exact opposite here. That's no, no way true. In verse 14 he says, Through the believing spouse, the unbelieving husband or wife is considered sanctified and the children are holy. The unbeliever, sanctified. The children, holy. Well, what is this saying? Is this saying that they're saved? No, it's not saying they're saved. The Bible is absolutely clear that an individual is only saved when they individually go before Christ, receive him as their hope and only savior. One person cannot believe 
and help uh, gain the salvation of another person. It's got to be person to person. So it's not meaning that the unbelieving spouse and the children suddenly become saved. Remember what we have said before, being holy and being sanctified means. It means to separate from something that is larger. We said if you go to your sock drawer and you pull out one sock, that sock is now considered technically holy, sanctified. It's been removed from a larger group, separated from a larger group and set aside. And that's what Paul is saying here happens in the home where one of the spouses is a believer. The truth uh, is this. A home is set apart for God's blessing when a husband or wife accepts him. A home is set apart for God's blessing when a husband or wife accepts him. That's what's being taught here. The unbelieving spouse will experience blessing upon their lives that they wouldn't otherwise know because of the believing spouse. Yes, that unbelieving spouse still needs to receive Christ. But because of that spouse's presence next to the believing spouse in the home and the, and the blessings from God that are coming down upon that believing spouse are flowing over onto the unbelieving spouse and flowing upon their children as well who might not yet have believed. One Christian in a home brings blessing upon the entire home. That's what is being taught here. One Christian in the home brings blessing upon the entire home. Uh, no, it's not a fully Christian home yet, but it's tremendously better than a totally unbelieving home. And then Paul says, is for this reason, for this very reason, to not divorce your unbelieving spouse if they want to stay. God's blessing is upon your home. God's blessing is upon them and your children. And that's a great advantage in helping them move toward the kingdom of God. So don't divorce your unbelieving spouse if they want to stay. Now, what if that unbelieving spouse does want to leave? They don't want to stay. Look at verses 15 and 16. It says, Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? We have ancient documents of women who were Christians who were married to non-Christian men in these days. And the husbands were angry at their wives because they were helping the poor and they were encouraging Christians and going around doing good deeds. The husbands hated this and they wanted to leave because of this, the, their wives' newfound faith. And even today, that type of thing happens. Uh, spouses get angry because they're their other spouse becomes suddenly Christian and religious and they don't like it and they want to leave. What does God say to do in that case? God's very clear here. Verse 15 says, let him leave. It says the brother or sister, the Christian, is not under bondage in such cases. Bondage means the bond, the bond of marriage and husband and wife is not there anymore. The bond is broken when the unbeliever says, I'm leaving. And that would give reason that they could, the Christian, could remarry. Because God says the bond is not there anymore. In the Bible, we have three conditions for remarrying. Three conditions for remarrying in the Bible. Number one, the death of a spouse. Number two would be adultery by a spouse, as we've just looked at. And then here, the leaving of an unbelieving spouse is a third reason that the, that the Bible gives for remarriage. Again, the idea is where divorce is permitted, then remarriage is permitted. And that's what we understand these verses to be teaching. So this is not a, uh, a sermon that is tremendously uplifting and inspiring. But it is what God wants his people to know. He wants us to understand uh, God, the options for Christians who have trouble in their marriages and that's number one, no divorce unless adultery is involved, and even then it's not required, but no divorce. And number two, for, for Christians married to non-Christians, how do you deal with problems? No divorce if the non-Christian wants to stay. Keep them there. It actually helps them to be in a situation where they can move closer to Christ. But number two, divorce if the non-Christian wants to leave. Don't fight them. 
You might think, well, we've we got to keep this marriage together because now, you know, you're going to lose God's blessing by walking away from this marriage and you might not get saved now. God says, let it go. Let him pursue them. The Christian is not to fight and say, no, we've got to make this work. If the, if the non-Christian is intent on leaving, God says, let them go. Let it divorce and let God deal with it. Now, again, these can be very, very hard words to hear. And it takes away an option that many, many people are taking today. But I want to end our sermon with the positive options that God says can be taken when there are marriage troubles. As I said, every marriage faces difficulties and troubles. Every single one. God is saying in this passage primarily what not to do. Don't take divorce as a way out, primarily, he's saying here. But what does God say to do? What are the positive things that you can do to help your marriage if it's going through difficulties at this time? Well, we find those options on the uh, what we call the airport card that we have actually in our foyer if you want to pick up another one on the way out. God gives us responsibilities that we're supposed to do in any hardship and they apply to our marriage uh, problems as well. And I just want to quickly go over those. If you're experiencing some marriage difficulties right now, Here's what God says, the, the positive options that you can take. Number one, keep God in the highest place of importance. Don't make your marriage or fixing your marriage partner the highest thing, most important thing. Keep God. There's only one important person who is the most important. Make sure he is that to you. Number two, close all open doors of sin in your life. You will not be accessing the power of God if you have open sins in your life that you're not dealing with. Make sure all those doors are closed. Number three, pray. pray prayer releases the enormous power of God. Think of a hurricane uh, type of power as you pray for your marriage, being released upon your marriage. Make sure you're doing that. Number uh, four, resist any demon involvement in your marriage. Satan hates marriages. He wants to stir up trouble. Take God's word literally. Submit yourself to him. Resist the devil so that he'll flee from you. Number five, seek solutions from God's word and godly counsel. And this is where we can look specifically in the Bible what it says to do for troubled marriages. The Bible is really clear. Husbands, honor and love your wives. Honor your wives, husband. Love your wives. Yeah, but she's not treating me well. God doesn't say, oh, well, then that's okay. You don't have to honor or love your wife. No, even though she doesn't treat you well, honor her and love her. That's what Christ did for the church when we did not treat him well. Husbands, honor and love your wives. Wives, live pure, godly lives that accept your husband's leadership. Very clear directions from God. If your husband isn't treating you well, still live a pure life. Still live a godly life in front of him. Still accept your husband's leadership unless it's something that breaks God's law. That is the right way for a wife to respond to her husband. Notice here, God doesn't say work to change and control your spouse. That is what most people want to do. My spouse isn't treating me well, so I'm going to work to control and change them. God doesn't say that. God says, instead, I want you to work to control and change yourself. Make sure you're being the best spouse that you can possibly be, and where you're falling short, fix it. I'll give you the power, God says, but you have to do, give the intention to be the best spouse you can be. Can your spouse point at you today and say that you are failing in a certain area? Take that away from your spouse. Let them not be able to fault you. And of course you can't be perfect, but you can aim at perfection. God says, make sure you are being the absolute best spouse that you can be. Don't spend your time trying to fix them. Make sure you have fixed yourself and becoming the best person you can be. More things uh, is that you can have church leaders hold offenders accountable. Bring in the church to counsel the, 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 the spouse who's causing problems and won't, won't listen to God's ways. Uh, this can involve uh, church discipline. God brought along the teachings of Matthew chapter 18 to be able to help move a person who is otherwise unmotivated to change through bringing all the church together and using that. And used in a responsible way, it can help save a marriage. Bring in church leaders. Uh, then seek separation if you're being abused. Just because you can't divorce doesn't mean you have to grin and take it if you're being verbally or emotionally abused. Uh, physically, too. Uh, 
uh, it is absolutely allowable to seek a, a, a temporary separation in order to work on the marriage from a distance. doesn't mean you give up on the marriage and walk away completely. You're still trying to save the marriage, but for your protection, protection of the children, you are separating yourself from abusive treatment. It might get to the point where you need to call on the police if you're in danger. God has given government in order to control and help and provide for people. Uh, so don't think that that is out of bounds. Where it is needed, use the government to be able to help and, and bring protection. Then going back to the uh, other list, rejoice by focusing on what is going right. Very often, it's so easy to get so down, you're focused on everything wrong that is going in the marriage. God says, don't do that. God commands us not to do that. But instead, as in Philippians 4, it says, focus on the things that are going right, that are excellent, that are anything that is going right. Focus on that and rejoice in those things. And then lastly, trust by expecting to experience God's promises. God gives many promises, and you need to trust him that you're going to experience those things. And again, if you take a card in the four, you'll find on the opposite side God's promises, and we'll just quickly review those. If you're married today, these promises are for you. God says, I know the good plans I have for you, God says. Uh, he says, I work all things together for good in your life, even your marriage problems. So don't think that this is out of bounds for God to be able to do something good through. You respond the right way. God is going to respond the way of making good in it. Number three, God will be with you and be your helper. You're not alone in your marriage problems. Number four, God will lead you in the way that you should go. Seek his leadership. What is the next best decision? Uh, he says, I will generously and gladly give you wisdom. Wisdom is making the best possible choices. God will lead you in making the best possible choices if you seek him. Claim that promise and expect him to fulfill it. God says, I will provide your needs. Look to him, not your spouse, to provide your needs. He says, I will take care of you. And he says, I will give you victory in your hardship. We'd like this to say, I will give you victory from your hardship. God doesn't promise that. Sometimes he does that. He says, I will give you victory in your hardship every single time. So keep focused on me. Keep fulfilling your responsibilities to being the best spouse that you can be. Listen to godly counsel. Listen to God's wisdom in the Bible. Do everything you know. In, in all of our problems, marriage problems included, there's God's part and there's our part. Make sure you're doing your part. And then count on God to do his part. This is what God says to do to make sure that marriage problems move in the right directions, not the wrong directions. Remember the great goal of all this. The great goal is what? To please Jesus. That's all that you have to do. Find out what pleases Jesus and do it. And that's what we've talked about this morning on how to please him and handle marriage problems the right way. You don't have to please other people. You are certainly not to make pleasing yourself top priority. Top priority is pleasing Jesus. We will stand before him one day, give account to him for everything we've done, and receive back the consequences and rewards or loss of rewards based on how we act now. And that is why this is an important sermon. In a day where people are just rampantly just walking away from their marriage and giving up and moving on, God says, I've got a better way. That is not the best way. That is not the right way. With a, with certain uh, conditions, just two conditions, the leaving of a spouse and the adultery of a spouse, divorce is not an option for, for fixing marriages. These other ones that we've covered are the option that God wants us to take. So this morning, if you're experiencing a difficult marriage, practice the options that God gives you. Don't stop. And then if you know someone who is seeking counsel and advice, steer them into the ways that Jesus is, 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 says are successful and prosperous. Steer them away from what this world is largely saying to do. Steer them into what God says, and they're going to be going in the right direction. All right.